in 2015, when we were running uh, the first uh, research and destroy CTF, it took them uh, around 30 minutes to find the first zero day vulnerability. Welcome, listeners, to the Industrial Security Podcast. My name is Nate Nelson. I'm sitting with Andrew Ginter, the Vice President of Industrial Security at Waterfall Security Solutions. He's going to introduce the subject and the guest of today's show. Andrew, how are you? It's going well. Thank you, Nate. We have two guests today. Anton Schipelin is the Global Pre-Sales Manager for the Kaspersky Industrial Cybersecurity Team. And Vladimir Deschenko is the Head of Vulnerability Research at Kaspersky's ICS CERT, the Industrial Control System Cyber Emergency Response Team. And our topic today is how Kaspersky is working with and contributing to the international industrial security community. Let's listen in. So Anton, thank you for joining us. Um, You're talking to us about how Kaspersky is working with and contributing to the industrial security community. I know you folks are doing a lot of stuff. Where would you like to start? Well, thanks for inviting us to the podcast. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, well, I, I'm a member of uh, Kaspersky Industrial Cybersecurity Business Development Team, and uh, uh, I'm a big fan of networking, a big fan of the topic of uh, industrial cybersecurity uh, in generally. Uh, as a Kaspersky, uh, uh, um, I working at Kaspersky, I'm a head of program committee for our in- international Kaspersky Industrial Cybersecurity Conference in Sochi. Uh, I, I do some stuff for building Russian, uh, Russian-speaking international community in Russia. And uh, I'm a big fan and a member of uh, BRISEC community as well. So uh, in Kaspersky, we try to do our best to help people, to help um, industrial facilities. Uh, like, uh, for example, uh, we not only uh, sell our security solutions to our clients, we also provide them for free for uh, research uh, uh, research communities, for laboratories, uh, for educational, for, per- for research purposes. This is uh, one of our contribution to them. Uh, another initiative, as I mentioned, is our Kaspersky Industrial Cybersecurity Conference. We are trying to make the, the great event uh, similar to such great events like uh, uh, like S4 in uh, US, uh, CS3 in Stockholm. We're working on the uh, big event in Russia. Uh, last year, for example, we had more than 300 uh, people attended and um, uh, people from more than 25 countries and uh, great speakers from all over the world, uh, US, Europe, Asia, Middle East. And uh, we're going to have it uh, again in Sochi. So we we'll always welcome guys to come to, to Russia, to great Sochi, to uh, to share information with Russian industrial community, mostly from Russia, Kazakhstan, Belarus and other countries. Andrew, I've never heard of this conference that he's referencing. Have Have you ever been there? Uh, I've heard of it, sort of in passing. I've never been to it. And when Anton mentioned it, uh, you know, after the the uh, the episode was recorded, I actually went and looked it up. You know, on the web, it's the Kaspersky Industrial Cybersecurity Conference. And what I was surprised by was, you know, his mention that it was more than three hundred people last year. Um, you know, the industrial security community is comparatively small. There is no event in the world that, ha- you know, that draws 20,000 people like Black Hat does or, you know, 6,000 people like the RSA event in the IT space. Um, you know, the biggest events that I'm aware of are S4 that I think drew something like 600, 550 people last year and is is projecting 700 this year. There's GridSecCon that draws 500 people. Uh, there's a couple of, of other events. You know, uh, CS3 is drawing three, 400 people in uh, in Europe. So I was surprised that this was a 300 person event. I'm I'm thinking I'm going to have to put it on my uh, on my to do list once uh, you know once international travel becomes possible again. So you mentioned that you're working with the industrial cybersecurity community. What are you doing uh, with that community? 
Well, thank for the question. Um, Russian industrial cybersecurity community is an independent not-profit uh, initiative uh, on developing a Russian-speaking international community uh, on industrial cybersecurity. So the the idea was to combine people together to to, uh, to share awareness, to share knowledge, to com- to, to 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 do professional networking, to uh, develop market in general. So we started it uh, with uh, several. Indi- uh, several individuals started it uh, three or four years uh, ago. We just created uh, several online platform for for information sharing, uh, just a Facebook group and Telegram chat, uh, and then we uh, started to 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 do the, uh, the meetups, informal meetups like BRISEC, the same in Russia, and uh, for example, lots of. Uh, People from uh, different companies, not only from Kaspersky, uh, contribute. Other uh, market players also contribute to this community with uh, in, with knowledge, with uh, some other initiatives. And we see that w- we are uh, able to combine people together in Russia. And we uh, I, it, we we saw that um, how uh, community built in US, for example, for, uh, at S four, everyone knows everyone and. Uh, we wanted the same, and uh, I, I can say that uh, it, it worked out finally. And uh, we borrow lots of ideas from all over the world, from other initiatives, from CS3 conference, from S4, from BRISEC, under one name. So this is our idea to, to, to make the professional cr- club on industrial cybersecurity. So what Anton just said there reminds me of a recent episode that we did with uh, Derek Harp of CSE. That's right. Um, you know, he talked about getting started with meetups, which are face-to-face meetings. They're they're you know very informal. Um, he uh, you know he talked about uh, a nonprofit organization, which is what CSE is. Uh, you know, he talked about. Um, you know the the focus being networking and, and forming a community. So, uh, yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it, it does sound very similar uh, for, of course, Russian language speakers. Uh, I mean, I would struggle in in that environment, but networking is important. Um, you know, my my boss, the the CEO of the company, is uh, a very big fan of of networking. Lior Frankel, you know, when he goes to an event, he doesn't uh, he doesn't go to sit in the back of the room and and listen to speakers. He goes there to meet people in the hallway. He's he's out there, you know, catching up with people. A lot of people. You know, new to the industry, especially very technical people, some of them are are are, are uncomfortable with networking, and uh, you know, Waterfall sponsors a bunch of networking events uh, quite routinely at at a lot of these these gatherings. The advice I give people when I invite them to a networking event is: look, you've got an opportunity with you know a beer in your hand, you've got an opportunity to talk to people and and learn stuff and and see what's going on. So, what I encourage people to do who are maybe alien to the concept is, you know, go in there, um, you know, find someone else who's standing around looking like a a deer, you know, a deer in the headlights, uh, doesn't know what is going on. Go up and introduce yourself and ask them questions. Ask these people, um, you know, so what, what are you working on nowadays? What's going on? Ask them, uh, you know, what did you just finish? Ask them, what did you learn from that? What was interesting? Ask them what's coming next. Ask them why it's coming next to get some insight into decision making processes. And a lot of the time, you know, people they they're not comfortable telling strangers, you know, stuff that that you know is in details of what's going on. But a question like "What did you learn from that?" Um, is a personal question. It's something that that people can answer. And when you when you uh, when you ask that question, when you get those insights, you learn what's interesting to other people. And, you know, what's interesting to other people might need to be interesting to you. You, you get ideas. It's, uh, you, you develop contacts and, you know, you come away with insights. So this is the advice I give to people in these, these networking environments. You know, networking is valuable. Use the opportunities when you have them. You know, start your own meetup. Attend the, the, uh, the ICS meetups. It doesn't matter what language. And, uh, you know, get out there and, and you know, start, start getting introduced. I don't know, Andrew. The only thing that to me sounds more difficult than doing industrial security is having to walk up to a complete stranger at a social event. 
Yes, well, that's why you 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 bring a little lubrication with you in the in the form of a beer. You mentioned the beer ISAC a couple of times. I mean, ISAC is Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Beer is beer. Can you talk about that? What what is that? Well, uh, great question. Uh, well, beer ISAC is a. Uh, Again, a not-profit initiative. It's kind of funny initiative for uh, connecting people together. Several experts started it uh, in 2016. Uh, Patrick Miller, Chris Strunk, Reed Whitman, uh, uh, as an idea to to share information. We all know that the the, the best uh, the best uh, information sharing when you have you know glass of beer or, or tea or coffee and you talk to you know to each other to, to share knowledge, share ideas. Uh, and there is I I. Uh, I uh, uh, I encounter the term in like beer intelligence, uh, so also the term for <laughs> beer ISAC initiative. And, uh, I support this idea. I, I have, you know, I'm an honored, uh, uh, beer ISAC coin holder. So I'm, so I'm happy to, to be part of this initiative. And, uh, as my, uh, personal, uh, contribution to the community, I created the, uh, created the public playlist for episode podcast on, on, uh, listen note service where I combined, uh, lots of great episodes from great uh, podcasts, uh, under the BRISEC, uh, logo name. So it's uh, my humble contribution to this initiative. So I'm always happy to participate and to promote this idea to, to Russia, to other countries. So I've actually been to a beer Isaac gathering. It is, it's not, you know, it's not a not-for-profit. It's not, it's not incorporated anywhere. It's a very informal, it's an idea. It's a, it's a convention. You know, it's a thing, it's a thing people do. It's a, it's a name people use. So, um, you know, I was at S4 uh, at the beginning of the year and uh, I think every night of the event there was the official event there was the official gathering and then you know when everything official is done there's this unofficial beer isaac and it's just you know nobody's rented space you just sort of gather in whatever space there is and there was a sort of a a, a dark quiet space by the the swimming pool in the uh in the hotel and people gathered there and you bring your own beer. Literally you go across the street to the beer store and you buy beer and you bring it back. Um, and you, you open your beer and you talk to people. It's very informal. And you know, the idea is information sharing and analysis centers are very formal mechanisms for sharing threat information, sharing intelligence. Um, and the theory, you know, that the, the, the founders here, Patrick Miller, Chris Sistrunk, Reed Whitman, their theory was, you know, um, the best information sharing happens informally, not on the record. So this is an off-the-record way to to network and share information. Um, you know, Anton mentioned a coin. A pro tip: when you come to the beer Isaac, bring a bottle opener, because it's frustrating to go to the beer store, buy a bunch of beer bottles, and discover that you can't open the wretched things until you find a coin holder. Now the coin. There's, I think there was something like a hundred of them minted, or there, there was a fixed number of them minted. Uh, you know, as far as I know, the founders here paid for these things out of their own pocket. They're they're lovely coins. They've got a, a you know a lovely beer Isaac logo on them, and they're not solid. They've got sort of holes in them. They're, they're, they're sort of the logo is is uh, in relief, and it, they're lovely things. And if you look at them carefully and you bring them close to a beer bottle, you go, this thing will open the beer bottle. They're actually a bottle opener. So, you know, they, these folks have been giving these coins out to people who are contributing to the ICS community, who are contributing to the informal Beer Isaac community. So Anton is a coin holder. Um, the, the, the Beer Isaac initiative is, again, very informal, very unofficial. Um, you know, I asked as a vendor, can we help? And they said, well, you know, Patrick told me, um, next time there's one of these events, uh, bring pizza. Okay, this is not an official sponsorship. There's no such thing. Okay, there's nothing official about this. There, there you know, you don't get to send up a, a, a booth with your logo. But uh, you know, if you want to bring pizza and grab a beer and go stand in the crowd, you know, we'd be grateful of that. You know, the word will spread that that you've brought the pizza, but there's nothing official about it. It's it's personal, and so um, yeah, it it's. Uh, I've been to a couple of them now. 
They're useful networking events. They're very informal, and I encourage anyone who's got an opportunity at one at a at a conference where there's where you hear the buzz about beer Isaac, ask the question, "Where's it going to be?" Go find some beer and bring it. I also recall that he mentioned a beer Isaac podcast. Andrew, is this yet another competitor that you and I have to destroy? <laughs> yes, well, something like that. Um, it's called a podcast. I mean, if you go on your, your favorite podcast app and you search for Beer Isaac podcast, you will find what appears to be a Beer Isaac podcast. It looks like a competitor, but in fact, it's not a competitor. It's a list. So it looks like a podcast. You can subscribe to it. I subscribe to the Beer Isaac podcast, but really it's a list. And what Anton does is he's, you know, he, he, uh, he searches the the internet he searches the podcast environment he listens to a lot of podcasts other people's podcasts and when there's an episode um that's relevant to industrial security he puts the episode he puts the the description of the episode in his list and so if you go to the beer isaac podcast that looks like a podcast and you listen to it you get vectored to somebody else's episode you hear but basically all of the industrial security podcast episodes are in his list. All of Dale Peterson's unsolicited response is in the list. And anytime anybody else does something, Enernex will do something or ThreatPost will do something on industrial security because these are, you know, ThreatPost talks about cybersecurity, Enernex talks about the the energy sector, about power grids. Anytime somebody else has a cybersecurity, an industrial cybersecurity episode, he'll put it in the list. So it's, uh, you know, it the the value he adds is you don't have to go searching for all this stuff. Uh, go to the beer Isaac list and you'll hear all the good stuff, all of our stuff, and anything else that sort of dribbles out of of these other podcasts. So the beer Isaac is fun. I mean, there you know, there's there's formal contributions you're making. There's informal contributions. What else are you folks up to? So one of the main ideas that we are following right now is uh, global knowledge sharing, experience sharing with the, uh, everyone around the world. So uh, the main idea is to save the world, to protect the world. Uh, and we believe that we can do it all together. So it doesn't matter like which company you work for, where are you at. So you need to fight with the, with the bad stuff, with the bad things. So the uh, one of the main things that we are working on right now is the knowledge sharing with the universities. This is a totally non-profit project. So we run different technical courses, educational courses for um, universities around the world. Uh, so we educate students and professors uh, in questions of um, industrial cybersecurity, uh, cybersecurity of Internet of Things, industrial Internet of Things, automotive and uh, other uh, unusual IT stuff around us. Uh, we also have a set of um, CTF competitions. This is a capture the flag competitions uh, uh, focusing on the practical questions of cybersecurity and not always industrial cybersecurity, but different. Uh, so we also run uh, different types of the competitions uh, focusing on the practical questions, practical problems in cybersecurity, not always industrial cybersecurity, but also uh, IoT cybersecurity, uh, industrial Internet of Things. So uh, these competitions are running uh, under the CTF uh, format. It can be uh, classical ways as uh, attack and defense or um, task-based CTF, or we even make some sort of research and destroy CTF. So we set up a real technological process uh, based on the real devices, real protocols, real software, uh, and we educate people, educate students uh, how to... You know, what are the typical vulnerabilities? What what are the typical security problems? And what cyber physical damage can be done if you exploit the set of vulnerabilities? So uh, this is all about the knowledge sharing programs. And based on that, of course, we have like a set of uh, commercial stuff for customers. So, But this is uh, outside of this uh, podcast. So I imagine that there's universities, post-secondary institutions all over the world who are ramping up with cybersecurity. I mean, the, the, 
the trends in the industry are just that, you know, attacks keep getting worse, that there's more software to attack, there's more connectivity, the less people attack. I think, you know, it's my impression that the, the, the topic is getting more and more widespread interest. If there's a post-secondary institution that's ramping up an industrial cybersecurity uh, set of courses or program, um, how would they get in touch with you? What, you know, what, if they want to reach you, who would they reach out to? That's a really good question. So, uh, so far we have uh, different ways uh, to reach us. Uh, some people, they're reaching us uh, through Twitter. So they just send me a direct message. Uh, other people contacted me through LinkedIn. Um, some people, they just, you know, contacting us uh, using like a general email address, uh, um, ICS uh, cert at Kaspersky.com. So multiple ways. We also had, had a dedicated uh, unit in our company uh, responsible for the uh, for the work with the universities with academia. Yeah, they also help us a lot uh, with that. So uh, promoting our trainings to them to helping with the relationship with universities. So this is one of the ways. So when we talk about uh, working with the universities, I mean you folks offer a lot of information into the community that that uh, you know. R- reports and stuff that that people use can you talk about that of course uh so the another uh, main principle that we have that uh all the research results that we have we publish them and so we have a set of uh, reports about the vulnerability research uh different threat intelligence reports several investigations and so on and so forth and uh, last year we decided to start one more um, thing so we have a pre-release sharing uh, reports with different uh, certs uh, either uh, national certs governmental certs um, uh, commercial certs i mean the product security teams and so on and so forth so we basically have a a list of uh, a list of certs uh, that uh, are willing uh, to have our reports you know five seven days before the official release and we get the feedback from them so it's very useful it's a really good win-win situation when they can you know take a look on what's happening right now what will be published they can start doing the mitigation process in uh, you know uh, for their assets and for us it's really good to get a feedback from from, from the uh, from the community and we, it's very easy to apply to get to this list. So you basically need to send us an email and asking uh, to have a pre-release copy of the report. So we're super happy to share it with with different uh, certs. And uh, based on that, of course, um, we are, we have um, a chapter in our threat intelligence portal where we publish. So first of all, we publish the threat intelligence reports uh, there, and um, after some time, we release them to, uh, release these reports to public. A word from our sponsor, Waterfall Security Solutions, is the OT security company. Waterfall's flagship product is the unidirectional security gateway. The gateway hardware is physically able to send information in only one direction, most often from a protected operations network out to an enterprise network. Unidirectional gateway software replicates servers in real time, most often replicating historian databases. Enterprise users can query the replica databases normally. No queries, or information, or attacks can be sent through the gateway hardware back into the industrial network that might put that network at risk. Unidirectional gateways are safe ITOT integration. For more information on the gateways, please visit Waterfall's website. Okay, so it, it may be a dumb question, but what language are these reports written in? <laughs> that's uh, that's a really good question. Uh, uh, so all the reports there in English. So we translate uh, reports. Uh, we have reports of in Russian and in English, but in threat uh, intelligence portal they're in English, of course. So it's uh, a universal international language that most of us are speaking, uh, especially in, in the cybersecurity community. So yeah, English. You talked about capture the flag as well. I mean, I know there's different versions of it at S4. There's pwn to own. There's there's sort of a, a um, 
you know, it, there was something that the Dale called capture the flag in the past. What what format do you use? So usually we use uh, three main formats, uh, two classical ones, as I mentioned. Um, the first one is uh, the um, task-based uh, CTF. So this is basically when different teams or individuals, uh, they have different set of tasks, basically technical questions that they need to solve technical problems and after solving each question they have uh, answer basically and this is uh, a text line as a string and they submit it to the to the system and they can understand if the if it was a correct answer or not uh, the second um, type of the CTF is attack and defense. Basically, <clears throat> this is the CTF, uh, the competition, when uh, different number of teams, let's say four teams, they have the same base, the same, uh, let's say, um, a, a, a fortress that they need to protect. Uh, and they need to uh, identify what types of the vulnerabilities they have and try to exploit these vulnerabilities at the other team's uh, fortress. So this is a very interesting competition because uh, each team, uh, they need to have their own services running and running, uh, stable running. Uh, they need to protect, uh, you know, the, fix the vulnerabilities and attack other teams. So it's a really good competition. And the third uh, is uh, the third type of CTF we call research and destroy. So this is basically we have um, a setup of a technical a technological process uh, based on the real devices, uh, real uh, SCADA software, uh, or HMI or uh, any other industrial software. Uh, the network protocols are also uh, have industrial b background and. Uh, one or several teams they need to uh, identify pre-made vulnerabilities or uh, some uh, some usually they find uh, zero day vulnerabilities um, and they need to get access to the uh, technological process and try to influence it try to do something that will cause a cyber physical effect so this is basically when a cyber attack causes a physical damage if I might get some clarity on that, um, if you're going to find zero days, that's not something you can do in an hour. Do you do you give people sort of warning and and you know a description of of what they're targeting? Uh, so usually, when people have, uh, are identifying the zero day vulnerability, they're pretty surprised. Uh, in 2015, when we were running uh, the first uh, research and destroy CTF, it took them uh, around 30 minutes to find the first zero day vulnerability. So sometimes it doesn't take you so much time to find something really interesting. And after uh, a team has found the vulnerability, uh, we had um, an agreement with them. So we immediately contacted with the vendor, introduced the team member to, you know, to product security uh, representative from the vendor side. And so they started the communication regarding the coordinated disclosure. So, yeah, this is a very important um, topic. So we always follow the coordinated disclosure uh, process with the vendors. <laughs> So I believe what he said there was they're finding zero day vulnerabilities in what, 30 minutes? Yeah, that that caught my ear as well. And it, it sort of confirms what I've heard anecdotally from uh, from from other people over the over the years. I mean, you know, finding zero days is is supposed to be hard. Um, and it kind of is in certain arenas. So, you know, parts of the IT space, basically the Windows operating system, um, the uh, you know the uh, the various browser environments um they've been heavily uh investigated and you know who does this it's uh in the security in the IT security space a lot of the time the people finding and reporting these zero days are service providers so if you have if you have a business doing uh i don't know incident response well it's not a steady business there's not incidents every day so you have idle periods between engagements or if you're doing uh, security assessments you know you might not have enough business to keep you busy uh, every day of the year when you've got time to yourself what do you do 
Well, you want to invest that time in a bit of marketing. And so what these folks do is they, uh, you know, get something, the the Adobe PDF reader, or, you know, start picking apart the, the Windows operating system and try to find zero days. And when they find one, they report it to the vendor, the vendor fixes it, the patch becomes available. And when it's announced to the world, these people's names are on the announcement. And now they've got they've got marketing, you know, they can, they can go to prospective clients and say, the client says, well, who are you? Why should I believe that you know anything? Well, look at these three vulnerability reports. You remember these? Yeah, these were bad ones. Whose name is on them? You found that stuff. Okay. Maybe I do want you looking at my stuff. So this is, this is the, the sort of the continuous investment in people finding zero days. And it really has become difficult to find zero days in certain uh, technologies that have been heavily inspected very little in the industrial space has been inspected to that degree. And so I've heard stories in the past of, you know, these these same security researchers, they have a, a, a spare day and they turn their attention to the industrial space and say, well, let me download a, a demo of an HMI or a historian or something off the internet and, uh, you know, see what I can do. And they, they get their coffee at 8.30 in the morning and they download this stuff and install it and start inspecting it. And they find a half dozen vulnerabilities before lunch. You know, two of them are critical remote code execution vulnerabilities. And they, you know, they they report them to the vendor. And a half hour later, they have a threatening letter from the vendor threatening to sue them. And they give up in disgust. You know, I've I've heard these stories, and you know, this is this is confirming that really there's there's uh, there's a lot of vulnerabilities to be found in the industrial space. All right. Now that all sounds convenient to us talking here about this, um, but it doesn't sound like great news for the industry in general. Not at all. And, you know, the, 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 this aspect of the industry, I think, is, is not widely understood. And, uh, you know, it leads to some really, some poor decision making. I mean, um, when was it? Six years ago, I think, 2014, the DHS ICS JWG conference, uh, you know, my boss, the uh, Lior Frankel, the, the CEO of Waterfall, um, had a speaking uh, session called Stop Patching, It's Stupid. And, you know, he had a standing room only crowd. There were three tracks. His track was just packed. And, you know, he started out, the first sentence he said in, in, the, in the, the presentation was, spoiler alert, the punchline is do not stop all of your patching. But patching on industrial networks is a lot less valuable than you might think it is. And, you know, there's many reasons for that. You know, the, the obvious one is a lot of these devices are still using plain text protocols and they have no authentication whatsoever. There's no passwords, there's nothing. So even if you find a dozen zero day remote code execution vulnerabilities, who cares? Because you don't need them. You just connect your, you know, open a TCP connection to the device, tell it what you want it to do, and it'll do it. You don't need zero days. And so, you know, patching, patching is expensive in the industrial world because you got to test each of these patches. Is it going to take my, my billion dollar plant down if I put a new software on here? Patching is a really expensive process. And, you know, because people in the IT space imagine you have to patch everything all the time. In the industrial space, well, if you've got a plain text protocol, there's not much point. And If you're using devices that really have not been inspected for zero days, then doing the really expensive patching of all of these devices for every vulnerability that's discovered is pointless if your enemies can go in there and find another zero day in half an hour. So the, you know, the, what people do in this space, patching is very expensive and less valuable than you might think it is. You've got to do a a careful risk assessment. A lot of security programs start with perimeter protection, you know, harden the the outer shell because the inside is just intrinsically soft. And, uh, you know, when, when the IT folks are coming into the space, they will often start not so much with perimeter protection, but with monitoring. Because then at least you can see a little bit of what's going on. You've got, you've got, so, you know, going in and trying to patch everything uh, is just is just hard and not terribly effective. And so people have to use these other mechanisms to secure the, the industrial space. This is one of the key differences between the industrial space and the IT space that is, is very poorly understood. 
Now, Anton, the other place that I've seen Kaspersky is in the Industrial Internet Consortium. I mean, Waterfall is active there. We've seen that you're active there. Um, can you talk about work that you're doing with the ISC and with, with other groups like that? Yeah, uh, we have a ded- dedicated team of uh, uh, analysts who are responsible for uh, participating in international standardization organization. This team is, uh, under the Kaspersky ICS CERT team. So, uh, they participate in, uh, developing standards in ENISA, uh, European, uh, cybersecurity agency, in Industrial Internet Consortium, ISO, uh, uh, in IEC and other, uh, organizations. They contribute with the content, with reviewing these documents. So, we're providing our experience expertise uh, our experience in cybersecurity to the to these uh, to these standards so for example uh, recently we contributed to um, a very interesting framework called security maturity model uh, this is a totally uh, open source framework uh, we have participated um, in con- in creating this uh, framework with the, within uh, industrial internet consortium and basically, this is the f- framework that allows you to uh, to measure how much security do you have, uh, and you can uh, take a look on how are secured your processes, how much security do you input in uh, creating your device technology, uh, whatever you have. And um, our team, we uh, provide uh, a consultancy, consultancy services, uh, how to, you know, be compliant uh, to this um, uh, framework. So I encourage uh, all the people to take a look on this uh, very good thing. So it might be it might be very useful for vendors uh, to see how secured they are, how secured are their solutions, and actually it can be a very good, let's say, a killer feature on the market if they see that they, uh, you know, uh, compliant to this framework. It's a good thing to have. So you mentioned it with the, the security model, um, you are measuring the security of a vendor. What does that mean? Are you talking about the, 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 the processes the vendor has for product development? Or are you talking about you know, a, a, a source code review on, on the, 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 a particular product? It's all together. It's a, a very comprehensive approach to see how secured uh, the vendor's processes, of course. Um, do they have uh, security coding practices if they provide the, uh, if they are following security development lifecycle, if there are any vulnerabilities in the, um, in the devices, in the solutions, and the most important, how do they react on the vulnerability reports? So it's not only, there is no separation between the processes, uh, device, uh, and uh, other things. It's all together. It's a very comprehensive approach. So, Nate, I wanted to um, add a, a little bit to this. You know, it's it's great that Kaspersky is contributing to all of these standards. If our listeners want to access these standards, um, you know, some are easier to get at than others. So. Um, ISO is the you know, the International Standards Organization. Um, you uh, you have to buy those standards, and, and they can be a little expensive for individuals. Now, organizations buy these things routinely. There are there are a few thousand dollars. You know, organizations can generally uh, it, it, you know each of them is is less than that. But you have to buy several of them, add them up. There's a set of them you you have to buy to make sense out of things, and it adds up to a few thousand dollars. Um, The IEC, the International Electrotechnical Commission, uh, similarly, you have to buy their standards, uh, but they tend to be more standalone. So, you know, if you spend 200 bucks on on an IEC standard, it kind of makes sense by itself. Um, INISA, though, is the European uh, standards. They they produce uh, less standards and more sort of best practice guidance. It's all free if you go Googling for that, and it's all available in the English language. Um, the Industrial Internet Consortium, the uh, the maturity model that that uh, these folks were talking about, um, it's free. Everything the IIC produces is free, and you can you can access it easily. Um, and you know, he talked about um, Kaspersky contributing to the process. 
I'd like to make a plug in here for the ISA, the uh, International Society for Automation. Um, if our listeners, any of our listeners, you know, are service providers and between gigs, they would like to contribute to the community and make a bit of a name for themselves and really get plugged into the very latest thinking, I would encourage them to um, – volunteer with the ISA on their SP99 committees. And the reason I say I, I mention you know ISA particularly in part is because it's very hard for mere mortals like you know an individual um, to contribute to ISO. The ISO standards are formed by committees of national representatives from you know every nation on the planet. And if you want to contribute to an ISO standard, you have to uh, you have to be nominated by your country. Same for ANISA. The, the member states nominate participants. Um, you know, same for the IEC. You, the, the, the countries of the world combine and, and nominate people to these things. Um, the Industrial Internet Consortium does not accept personal memberships, only accepts corporate memberships. And so it's a little bit expensive. But the ISA, uh, you can contribute to the ISA standards um, you know, without even being an ISA member. And, and an ISA membership costs, I think, 130 bucks US. And the, you know, the beauty of this is that the IEC standards, yeah, they have a lot of standards in a lot of domains. Cyber in, Industrial cybersecurity is only one of those domains. Where do the IEC industrial security standards come from? IEC 62443 is the one everybody cites. Um, they come from the ISA. The ISA SP99 committee writes the standard and the IEC publishes it. So you don't need to be on the national committee to contribute to the industrial security standards. You go and you volunteer. It's a completely volunteer effort at the, the ISA SP99 committee and you can get involved. You can get your name on the standard. You can get plugged into the latest thinking and, you know, help the world by, by producing these standards. And, you know, to finish the thought on the ISA, if you actually buy a membership, you get access to all of the ISA standards. And they produce standards you know, for cybersecurity that are published by the IEC. They produce standards for you know, HMI, alarm administration. They produce standards for safety systems. And if you're a member, you don't have to pay for those standards. You can get online access to the standards as part of your membership. So there's a plug for anyone who personally wants to get involved. Um, the ANISA outputs are free. The IE, uh, IIC outputs are free. And if you get involved with the ISA, you can get both input and the results of the IEC standards uh, you know, for the cost of your membership. So we like to leave our guests with the last word. Is there a, a thought you'd like to leave with our listeners? Well, actually, the main idea I would like to to say to listeners, you know, we have to, you know, we we have to work together. We were we live in the same world. Uh, we, a defensive people, have to be together, help to, to to each other. It's the only way we can, you know, to build the safer safer world. Even with even if we are, uh, despite we are uh, the competitors, we the the colleagues, we, we work the same, you know, direction. So we have to be together. And uh, the last, uh, my message to the audience as a part of this uh, community contribution, as I mentioned, uh, I would like to pay attention to, I would like to, uh, to invite you to have a look at the our Kaspersky Industrial Security, Security Conference in Sochi, and uh, to submit to attend and to, well, to, to attend the our community. Thank you. Andrew, for a last word, you and I now are recording while social distancing, as is most of the world. Um, they just plugged their conference. Um, is it still going to happen? Uh, that's a good question. I looked on the website just now, and you know, at the time of this recording, it's still on. Um, you know, we, we actually recorded this uh, you know, Anton's commentary here uh, a little while ago at the S4 conference. And, you know, back then COVID was barely on, on anybody's radar. So the, the conference, you know, on the website is still on September 2nd through 4th. Uh, it might still happen. You know, you'd think by now it would have been canceled if it's going to be canceled. It might be happening really for anyone who can still get to Russia. You know, for me, I live in Canada. Um, you know, the Canadian government's advice is, well, we will let you leave the country if you want, 
to go somewhere else, but you might not be able to get back in. And if the situation gets, you know, changes, uh, you know, we might not even be able to go out and fetch you. So um, I probably won't be leaving Canada anytime soon. I'm, I might put this conference on my to-do list next year, um, but it it uh, it might still be a going concern, sort of locally for for the the local Russian community who can who can still get to it. All right, that'll just about do it then. Thanks to Anton Shipulin and Vladimir Dashenko for speaking with you, Andrew. And as always, thank you for speaking with me. Always a pleasure. I'll catch you next time. This has been the Industrial Security Podcast from Waterfall. Thanks to everybody listening. <laughs>